Hello, I'm Jim Demo with Clark Vancouver Television. Today, as part of CBTV's 2014 general election coverage, we're speaking with candidates running for state representative, position one of the 17th Legislative District. With us are the Democrat incumbent, Monica Stonier, and the Republican challenger, Linda Wilson. Hello. Uh, let's, Linda, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about your background. Okay, well, I was, uh, I'm a native Washingtonian, and I have been living in Clark County for the last 43 years, all but about three of those in the 17th district. I've been married for almost 30 years. We have three grown daughters um, and one adorable grandson. Um, I am a business owner. We own DeWills Industries, such a kitchen cabinet manufacturer located in uh, the heart of, of orchards. We've been around for 55 years, and we employ about 130 people. Um, I have been involved in um, the community for quite some time, and I guess one of my last most recent things I do now is I'm a member of the um, Southwest Washington Search and Rescue Team. Okay. Monica, tell us about your background. Uh, I've been living here in Vancouver with my husband. Uh, we chose Vancouver very intentionally to raise our family for strong schools and, and just the quality of life and lots of fun things to do for families here in the area. Um, so we've been here for almost 15 years now and um, really looking forward to um, this, this upcoming school year. Everybody's getting ready for school and, and getting back to school. So uh, the, the family is in the middle of all of, all of that. Uh, we, I'm a, a local teacher. I work at Pacific Middle School, and I'm a teacher trainer. I've been providing professional development for teachers and principals in our district for 14 years um, or serving in the classroom. And uh, I think that experience is, is important given this upcoming session. Um, my husband and I um, spend a lot of time with our, our family schedule, busy uh, soccer schedule, and, and very family-centered. And, um, and we really enjoy Clark County. Okay. Monica, why should voters re-elect you for this position? Um, I think for two reasons. I think the first reason, uh, as I mentioned, my background and experience in education um, is, is going to be crucial in this upcoming session. Um, I, uh, for that reason, serve as the vice chair on the House Education Committee. And I am at the table when a lot of those decisions are made. And Leaders from, from the Republican side and the Democratic side, both in the House and the Senate, came to me for perspective and experience and, and for some feedback. Um, it became very clear to me that that, that was very necessary uh, in a legislature where there are uh, few, if any, uh, practicing teachers who, who work with kids and with teachers in the classroom. Um, so, so that experience, I think, is crucial and, and very uh, is going to be front and center of that conversation uh, this upcoming session. And the second reason is I just think I'm, I'm the best fit for the district. Um, I've been able to keep my word on things that I think matter most to, to, the, to the voters here. And um, I think people really appreciate somebody who works across the aisle to get things done. And uh, my record shows that as well. Okay. And Linda, why should voters select you for this position? Well, I have quite a diverse background and quite uh, vast life experiences. I've worked in the private sector all of my life. Um, I have the message that I have of job creation and um, limited government is seems to be resonating with the voters. Um, I have many business organizations that are um, recognizing that I am the candidate that is pro business, pro pro job, and um, I'm I understand their problems and their obstacles and. Uh, I've been endorsed by Association of Washington Business, the National Federation of Independent Business, the Farm Bureau, um, the Builders Industry Association, the Realtors, and, and several more. Um, they put their trust in me, and I believe that that's a good thing. It's important that we get Clark County back to work and with good paying jobs. Okay. Uh, Linda, if voters select you for this position, what would be your top three goals? I'd like to create a, uh, an environment of economic opportunity. Really, I, need, I would like to see the education, uh, that we have an education system that helps, that helps children. It's, it's directed toward children and students rather than the education bureaucracy. And then in general, I would like to just do things that are important to the quality of life in, in Washington State, to improve the quality of life in Washington State. Okay. Monica, if reelected, what would be your top three goals? 
Um, definitely jobs are very important uh, in Clark County. We're the hardest hit and probably going to be the last to recover in Washington State when it comes to the economy. And, uh, you know, we've, we have an Economic Development Council here locally that does a really great job of recruiting companies that are looking to relocate or that may already have employees that live in Clark County, like Integra and Banfield. Um, and we also have a strong partnership between our public schools and some of our businesses like SEH America, which I think is a fantastic blueprint for a partnership between education and the, and the, um, and the business community to develop a workforce, which then brings me to my second goal, which is uh, making sure that our, our public schools are providing a workforce um, that is, that is um, thoughtful and, and critical thinking, is valued and innovative and, and collaborative. Um, and, and I think that if we can continue to invest in our schools in that way, uh, we'll be supplying the district with, with those, um, those workers that are valued. And, and I think my third um, goal is really to restore, I think, trust in our local elected officials. We have, um, in my opinion, some, some who have really broken down that trust. And, and when I talk to folks at the door, they're really frustrated and feel ignored. I think by federal and local government, and so um, I, I make it a real point to, to talk to folks and to make sure that they understand that you know I'm open to I, I have town halls and, and I have um, telephone town halls when I'm in session. I'm very open to feedback and input, and I think that also helps me really understand what voters are looking for. Now, Monica, you already kind of talked about this as one of your top goals, but the the economy, the jobs, mm -hmm. job. The unemployment rate has improved, but wages have remained fairly stagnant. Uh, what policies would you propose to accelerate the economic turnaround and to spur economic development in mm -hmm. Clark County? I think that, um, in, in when I've talked with folks who are who are running businesses, they they really struggle. They're very fearful of, of some of the proposed uh, legislation that was on um, on the docket this last time around, like the minimum wage, for example. Um, business owners I talk to prefer to be able to offer a benefits package or negotiate and talk with their with their workers talk about what is a best fit and so as long as we're not closing the door to um, employers being able to have those conversations and work with their employees and not um, have that kind of segmented to one strategy which may be in an hourly wage um, I think we need to we need to continue keeping that open dialogue going and and um, you know, I've I've made sure that I'm listening to both sides when when looking at those policies, and um, I think my positions on those resonate with the district as well. Okay, Linda, your jobs, your your idea on uh, improving a, a job, not only job creation as well as uh, economic recovery. Well, this is really the heart of my campaign. Um, I believe that economic opportunity should be everyone should have the ability to get a good job and. I think that's really important. Um, <clears throat> what is good for Washington State is good for Clark County. We need to um, reduce regulations. We not just streamline them, but actually reduce them and reduce taxes. Um, it's important that, um, well, and, and most of all, I think we, what we need to do is we need to make sure that we do not get an income tax, state income tax. I know that that is being discussed. Um, it is in the Democratic part, Party platform, <clears throat> so it's front and center for them. And uh, I don't think that that's, uh, that will be very harmful to our, our, our economy and um, very harmful to, uh, it will be a job killer. Okay. Let's also talk <laughs> about uh, one controversial economic opportunity is increased rail transportation of fossil fuels through Washington State as well as Southwest Washington. What action should the legislature do if any, um, to address the safety and environmental concerns? Well, <clears throat> the rail lines are federally, it's under the federal jurisdiction. So um, legislatively, I'm not real sure exactly what we can do. I know that um, there is a lot of um, increase in, in, of course, safety is of utmost importance. So um, we need to look at the rail lines. The rail lines themselves are, are being improved. The um, the standard rail line is like 10 miles per hour. They're increasing them to 25 miles per hour, even though they don't tend to go that fast, but that's what they're doing. Um, and then the, um, uh, oh gosh, sorry. Um, rail line, oh, and then um, what we need to do is continue to talk with the ports because they have a, a safety plan, and that safety plan goes along with the, um, you know, the, the land, the marine, and, and the rail lines. So I think it's important. Um, 
you know, it's just just making sure that everything is safe. Okay, uh, Monica, um, should the legislature take any action, um, if any, um, f to address the safety concerns about rail transport or fossil fuels? Uh, the legislature won't be able to weigh in on that decision on whether or not there's an oil terminal uh, built here in, in the port of Vancouver. The the port will weigh in there, our local elected officials will weigh in, and the governor will have a say. Um, as legislators, we won't have a say in that. Um, my position is really from a value standpoint. You know, I think that the number of jobs is incredibly important. And when you talk about a limited number of jobs in just one industry at an oil and at an oil um, uh, facility, compared to uh, a robust and diverse business community and with a waterfront property, uh, that would be my ch choice. That is that waterfront property and that um, business image is really what Clark County and Vancouver has been investing in for years. It's who, how we want to be identified. And with a, a security concern like an, an oil terminal uh, right here in Vancouver on the m mouth of the Columbia River, I think uh, will really turn a lot of those investors and a lot of that business community away. Uh, I want to stay the course with, with what we've been doing here in Clark County. Okay. Uh, Monica, with the, the Columbia River crossing proposal now dead, what steps should the legislature do to address uh, interstate transportation uh, congestion over the Columbia River? Well, we certainly have some um, relationships to rebuild. Uh, I, can, I can say that for sure. Uh, we have a handful of local legislators uh, that have burned a lot of bridges across the river uh, with legislators in Oregon and, quite frankly, have um, stained our reputation here in southwest Washington with the rest of the legislators statewide in, in Washington. Uh, some of us who have been able to continue the conversations rather than be divisive uh, will be at the table because um, I think we are, we are, we are more um, engaged in real conversations around solutions there. Uh, so we certainly need to start a communication with Oregon and make sure that it's a real conversation about not only what our shared values are in the transportation package, and what is best for the economy, but also the differences between our communities and how both of those are honored in whatever proposal comes up next. Okay, Linda, what steps should the legislature take to address uh, interstate transportation congestion over the I Columbia River? Excuse me. Well, um, I believe that we need a third transportation corridor. And whatever, wherever this occurs, west side or east side, we need to make sure that there's at least two issues addressed in this. Um, one would be traffic congestion, and the other would be freight mobility. Um, we, the Columbia River crossing didn't address either one of those, and that was one of its biggest flaws. Um, we have a problem with the Oregon side in that there is a, they have a physical inability to actually ex um, extend, the, widen the freeway. So whatever trafficked corridor, the new corridor, needs to bypass Portland because they can't fix that. So I think that's the most important thing is, is um, making sure that we address these, these issues because we understand that transportation infrastructure is, is, is important. We have to keep the commerce moving. Okay. And then, uh, Linda, um, what steps would you take to ensure Clark County receives its fair share of transportation funding from the state? Well, I am very interested in the Transportation Committee. I would like to be on it um, <clears throat> uh, as a business. Uh, Transportation is very important to us, the infrastructure. We ship all over um, the, the country and uh, over to Asia as well. So I understand the importance of this, of having a good infrastructure. Um, we already have two of our Clark County representatives on the Transportation Committee, um, Liz, Liz Pike and Jim Moeller. So I think that having a third person on this Transportation Committee would help to ensure that Clark County gets the funding that we need for whatever projects that are important. Monica, what would you do to ensure we get the fair share of transportation funding from the state? Well, when the Senate proposal for a transportation package that ended up not passing um, came out, Southwest Washington was embarrassingly, embarrassingly underrepresented. Uh, we had $450 million in the original budget and then um, close to nothing in the second budget that came around. And, and the House budget wasn't much better. So uh, I wrote a letter and, and got signatures from our Southwest Washington delegation to support a transportation package that had projects in it, like um, a, a rail project in, in Ridgefield, uh, the Highway 14 uh, project that's been on, on the list for some time now. 
and some other projects around uh, that I think uh, would, in my opinion, um, definitely contribute to a, a better economy because that was my, my metric, was, was this going to contribute to a healthier economy? And I, I found the projects I thought would have the greatest impact, put them on a, on a list, and collected signatures from um, both sides of the aisle here in Southwest Washington. And I think when you can show that people share those values and those goals around a transportation package, um, that shows uh, some conversation is happening and, and some hard work is getting done to, to bring people together. And quite frankly, um, the, the legislature needs our Southwest Washington votes to pass any package. So they're going to want to see us unified, and, and I'll continue to be that unifying force in, in the area. Okay. Monica, the state, Washington State Supreme Court recently held the legislature in contempt for not making enough progress toward fully funding public education following the McCleary decision. What steps should the legislature do to comply with this ruling? Well, um, as I mentioned before, I've been committed to not voting for tax increases, and um, I also do not support uh, what some of my friends think would be a solution, which is an income tax. I've been openly against that since I ran in 2010, and my position has never changed and will not change. Um, so what we really have to do is get real about what kinds of corporate tax exemptions are on the books that are no longer serving their intended purpose. We have uh, a committee in the legislature that reviews those, and they have made recommendations for some, some exemptions that should no longer be on the books because they've, they're outdated, they're no longer serving their purpose, and I'm looking for the political will and my colleagues to actually roll some of those back so that we are funding education in a way that doesn't put our, more mo our most vulnerable folks um, at a disadvantage or take away the services that they really need. Uh, and unfortunately, the proposal that came from the Senate Republicans was one that touts education first. Uh, what that really means is funding that fully uh, with the given structure and tax base that we have, leaving everything else to be cut. And, and I don't think that's a healthy approach. I think that is uh, bad for our most vulnerable citizens in the community. And we have to be much smarter about that and follow some of the recommendations from our own joint uh, legislative review committee. Um, Linda, how should the legislature respond to the Supreme Court ruling? Well, we, we know that, the, that our Constitution tells us that it's a paramount duty to fund education. However, um, it, it, the Supreme Court also indicated that when the, it, it isn't just about funding. We also, they indicated that it is, they can't throw more money at an outmoded system and expect it to succeed. So. That being said, um, I am also one of those Republicans who, and, and of many, that have said that we need to fund education first. So when the legislature finally determines what kind of, um, what actual bas basic education should actually be, should be, then they should fund that first. You'll, you'll take the money off the top of your, uh, your budget and fund it. Then when you get down to any other, um, the, the rest of the priorities that you need, um, like transportation infrastructure and public safety and f funding the programs for the most vulnerable. You get down to the bottom of those and then, and then below that, you'll be discussing those programs. You won't be discussing what we th keep thinking we're talking about education. We're actually gonna be talking about the programs that need to be funded because education will have already been funded because it's important to do that. Okay, <laughs> well, what recommendations do you have for improving state universities and community colleges? Well, you know, I think our state communities are, and colleges are, are doing a pretty good job. Um, I would like to make sure that the tuition funding, or tuition is actually um, kept at a low figure or as low as we can get it. I hate to see kids going into debt for a lifetime. Um, I'd like to uh, understand a little more about um, why it takes only 40% of the kids actually graduate in a four-year time span for a four-year degree. I think that that needs to be looked at. And uh, also, I think that there there's needs to be more encouragement for STEM programs or, and STEM classes and encourage the students to take them. There's a lot of businesses out there right now that are looking for kids or students, graduates, that have these abilities, these, these STEM abilities. And um, it's hard for them to find these, these people to hire. And it's important that uh, that they have these people available to do that. Okay. 
Monica, suggestions for improving these state universities and community colleges? Yeah, I think in, in Vancouver we have some really great examples of um, diverse approaches to higher education. And uh, to answer the question, I know that one of the reasons why students are not finishing four-year programs is because when you go to Clark College, for example, and you're taking a class or entering a program um, that may not take that full length of time, in order to get financial aid, you have to actually sign up for a program that's for you, even if it's not your intent to finish it. And, and so in Clark County, we have Clark College that is serving students that are not just in a four-year university setting, they're bettering themselves for the community and trade programs and apprenticeships and, and in other ways. And so it's not fair that we're penalized as a region or that colleges are seen as um, inadequate for that reason. Uh, so I think we need to fix the way we're looking at higher education in that way. Um, I think that we uh, need to take a better look at the transparency in, in spending at the college level. Students have a right to know when they're writing a check for tuition and incurring debt um, how those tuition dollars are being spent. And I've run into a little bit of problems there, but our financial aid funding needs to be more consistent and, and better supportive of students so that they, they know when they're going to be finishing their programs when they're, when they're depending on financial aid. Okay. Monica, we spent much of the time talking kind of the challenges facing Washington State. What are some opportunities you see for the state and how will you work, work to take advantage of those resources? Well, you know, I think some of the answers to the state problems uh, that, we, that we are talking about in Olympia start right here in Vancouver. I and mean, we have a cutting edge coalition around early learning um, that is asking community members and stakeholders to come together to, to really envision what early learning could look like for families who are working and need that for their families in order to, um, to stay employed and to contribute to the economy. Uh, that's starting right here in this area. It's a self-program, if, if folks haven't looked into it, it's really a great coalition um, and is looking, being looked at from a nationwide perspective as a model. Uh, we have advocates here in Clark County who are working with our citizens with disabilities with um, such passion and such uh, well, a well-educated background in teaching folks to advocate for themselves, even in Olympia, um, to lobby for what is best for citizens with disabilities. So that is a hallmark, I think, of Southwest Washington. And additionally, I mentioned before the partnership between our public schools and our business uh, communi communities. Um, I think that we have a lot of the answers for, for Washington State right here in Southwest Washington with the passion and the, and the talent of folks who are working here. And I'm going to continue seeking those people out, finding out what they know, and seeing what applies to Washington State as a whole. Okay, Linda, what are some opportunities and how would you use the resources to, to get those opportunities? Well, Washington State is geographically placed to take strategic um, opportunities to, for trade on the Pacific Rim. And uh, in fact, our business ships to Japan and, and um, other parts of Asia. So I think probably what we need to do is make sure that we do not place any obstacles um, to, to this trade um, and help that, hope that we don't create any more um, regulations that will hinder any of this because trade is, is a huge for Washington State. Um, as well, Washington State does not have a state income tax, and uh, we need to keep it that way so that we continue to invite businesses to come into Washington State. This is, that is one huge reason why they come. I, I hear, I've heard of several that have not come into Washington State because they thought that we were going to, well, some of the tax structure even now is, is difficult for them. Um, but keeping, the, this, keeping a state income tax off the plate is, uh, the best thing for Washington State. Okay. Do you think the, the state currently has a good balance between environmental protection and economic, economic development? And if not, what would you do to help correct that balance? Um, oh, gosh. I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? Sure, sure. Uh, do you think the state currently has a good balance between economic development and environmental protection? Oh. And if not, what would you do to sure. correct that? I'm sorry. Okay, sure. Um, uh, yeah, the, I believe that um, economic, our economic policies uh, actually need to be based on sound science. Um, I don't believe that, um, as an example right now, um, we have the governor looking at the carbon tax re uh, fuel reduction 
And um, that right there would raise our gas taxes by a, over a dollar per gallon. Then you have the stormwater regulation, and that's based on fish consumption. And uh, the, what we've got here is all these things that he's trying to do, which will basically do nothing for our environment. But the cost will, um, is the cost will affect the people that can afford it the least. So you have your stormwater regulation. Uh, that could increase our, our sewer rates by, it will, they'll skyrocket. So um, I do believe that we need to um, make sure that, that it is based on sound, um, sound policies, sound scientific policies. Okay, Monica, is there a good balance between environmental protection, economic development? If not, what would you do to correct that balance? I, I think there's a good balance. It's not perfect, but uh, it's definitely one of those areas where our common interests keep us accountable. So, you know, the, the business community is definitely struggling with um, stormwater regulations that are quite burdensome, but the environmental community is struggling to keep forests and streams uh, healthy and safe and, and strong. Um, but even you know serving as small businesses up and down the rivers for fisheries sports sportsmen and, and sportswomen I think that we um, certainly have uh, a reputation here in this area for continuing to work on that balance uh, we it's, it's one of those jobs that's never going to be done it's one of those areas where you need thoughtful um, and collaborative people together at the table to make sure that we're talking about exactly what you say, a balance, not one way or the other. Um, we want to be hiking and, and biking and kayaking in Southwest Washington and in the Pacific Northwest, and uh, that's something we all share a value in. So this is definitely one of those areas that's in all hands on deck, stay engaged, stay attentive, um, and, and where our common values bring us together for, for that balance. So I think we're doing a pretty good job. Just have to keep at it. Okay. Monica, we've made it to the end. So here's the final question. What makes you the better candidate? I believe I'm the better candidate because I'm the best fit. Um, I have, and, and also the voters already know what they're getting. They know they're going to get somebody who's not voting for tax increases when there are other solutions to be considered. They know they're going to get somebody who thinks about the issues deeply and brings all stakeholders together. Uh, to listen to what different sides have to say so that the solution on the table is best for everybody, not just one side. Uh, they know they're going to get somebody with background and experience uh, that is most important in this upcoming session in education. They know they're going to get somebody who's always upfront and who keeps her word. And um, they know they're going to get somebody who's effective. Uh, as I m I've mentioned before, I passed more bills in my freshman year than any other freshman legislator because I focused on the things that matter most to the most people and to the things uh, I focused on the things that would would get us the furthest in a short amount of time and I work hard to bring people together um, all of my bills are bipartisan in sponsorship uh, it's inf incredibly important to me to make sure I'm working on things that are respected by all corners of the community okay Linda what makes you the better candidate well um, I believe that I have, been, I have been recognized as the jobs candidate. I believe that uh, as a business owner, I understand the um, ups and downs and the obstacles that it takes or that occur to create jobs. And um, I, I think that utmost importance right now is to get our economy back on track. We still have a lot of people that are, um, they have they have jobs, but they don't have the jobs they want. They want a better job. And I think that um, with all the endorsements that I have received from the business communities, including the Farm Bureau, um, they understand that I am, they, they, they tell me, they get that it, they're excited that there's someone running that actually gets it. And uh, I do, I get it. I live it every day um, in our business. And so um, it's very important, I think, that um, we put someone up in the, in the legislature that can understand the, uh, the budgeting and the accounting and what it takes to get the, the, the state back on track. Okay, well thank you both for meeting with us and good thank luck you, with your campaigns. You. Thank you.